See, if there's anything that you should learn about this video right off the bat, it's that I'm not here to instruct you how to build a computer because it can go horribly wrong very quickly, even if you know what you're doing. Oh God. Before we get to that though, along with some other complications, let's talk about what makes this build special and why it even happened in the first place. MSI Canada decided to send over the RTX 5070 Ti, like the Vanguard, launch edition one. So I had to make a parts list and I had to get a budget in order. $1,500. This needs to include the case, the processor, the memory, the storage, the power supply, quite literally everything except for the GPU. And to be clear, this video isn't sponsored by MSI or anything. They did send the GPU over, which I do get to keep, but they don't have any final word on this video. They don't even get to see it before it goes live. So everything that I'm saying about this thing is my opinions and only my opinion. Now, when building, I don't usually like to source components from multiple places. I like checking stock and getting everything all in one go at one store. So I made a trip to Canada Computers. Best Buy doesn't have that great of a selection. So you kind of just have to make do with what you have. Yeah, this is what I wanted to do exactly, but it's like 450 for a board. And then you're kind of screwed on like GPU size. I was just saying it's been too long. I feel like every time I've built the PC, it's been within like four months from each other. Now it's been almost a whole year, which that sounds so like pretentious, but this is just like a hobby of mine. <laughs> like, yeah, I know, like literally since I was a kid. Okay, but I'm like hyped now because everything gets to be put together. And then when the GPU comes in, it's just go time. The most important part of any PC build though is the platform. The first decision that I needed to make was would it be AMD or would it be Intel? I decided to go with the Ryzen 5 9600X. I found the performance to be very good since I want it to sit in a smaller case. And because of that, thermals were also a really big factor. The 9600X seemed like the safest bet over the i5 14600K. It is a touch slower by a percentage or two in most titles, but this isn't gonna be something that matters. And for $339, it was really hard to pass up. Now, keep in mind all the prices in this video are going to be in Canadian, so if everything sounds super inflated to you, that's why. For the motherboard, I chose a cheap Asus Tough B650ME since it was part of a bundle deal along with a decently spec kit of Corsair Vengeance DDR5 RAM. The motherboard has 2.5 gigabit ethernet, which is important to me since I have fiber at home. And it does also support Wi-Fi 6 and it comes with an antenna, which is beneficial for me right now since I'm at the studio and don't actually have ethernet here. It also does support PCIe 5.0, which is solid, and of course it has M.2 slots. Keep in mind that despite this being a pretty cheap motherboard, it actually offers quite a bit in terms of future-proofing, and its smaller MATX size means that I can fit it into a smaller case. I would have gone ITX because I really like the way that ITX PCs can look. They're very small and compact, but if I went ITX, things like the motherboard and the power supply would have had to have been ITX and SF, and it would have doubled or if not tripled the cost in some cases, including the case because the cases can be really expensive for ITX. Now, this is the RAM. This is a kit of Corsair Vengeance 32 gigs and it's a dual DIMM kit, meaning that there's two 16 gigabyte DIMMs inside of here, but it's 6,400 megahertz, which is very important. And it's also important that your memory is compatible with your platform, whether it's Intel or AMD, because you have Expo and XMP profiles. Using the these XMP profiles is actually how you get the most out of your kit because by default, unless you go into the BIOS, it runs at such a slower speed that it's not even funny. Now I knew RAM speed would be important for AMD, but to be honest, I'm mostly just using this computer for gaming. So it's not something that I really wanted to overspend on since I didn't really think that it would be that important for that application. So this kit along with the motherboard seemed like a really good value and that's what I ultimately ended up choosing. Note that it is RGB, but I don't care about that and I'll talk about that in a second. Now I wanted to keep this entire thing cool, but I also wanted a smaller chassis. Like I said, it's hard to find one that can fit a decently specced GPU. Um, immense foreshadowing on that a little later, but I ended up settling on this Lian Li M3 Dan. It's $99. It seemed like the perfect case with mesh side panels to keep temps down. And it'll also hide all of my cable mess. And it even has enough room for a 360 millimeter 
all-in-one cooler. For the power supply, I settled on MSI's MAG A850GL. It's a fully modular power supply, which is great for this build, but it also is 850 watts, includes a 12 volt high power cable for these new GPUs. It's silent, and I've heard a lot of really good things about these units. A power supply is not something that you wanna make a mistake with because it could cost you your entire build. So even though this one was, in my opinion, pretty fairly priced at about 160 Canadian dollars, I'm very happy that I went this route because again, 80 plus gold, 850 watts. Not only does this allow my system to be upgradable and I could throw in higher power components inside at a later date, but it will also just give me the peace of mind. Now, as for the CPU cooler, cooling is really important to me. I want low temperatures. I don't want a crazy amount of heat radiating beside me. And I also want the PC to run as close to silent as possible. The problem is, is that 360 millimeter coolers are expensive and usually have a ton of useless RGB, which doesn't make sense for something like this build since the panels, like I mentioned before, are just mesh and you won't really be seeing it. I found the Deepcool LS270S for $120. Now I've had a lot of luck with Deepcool in the past building friends PCs, so I figured that I would take a chance on it. And I'm really glad that I did. It's all black, it has a 360 millimeter radiator, it has a copper plate, and honestly, it should be more than enough for the 9600X dare I say maybe even overkill. I did also add a fan at the rear as an intake. Uh, this was just like an additional $20 purchase that I felt like was necessary since the only airflow is really coming in from the graphics card at the bottom and it's a flow through design. So I don't want all of that hot air just getting sucked up immediately by the radiator and being pulled into the CPU. So this was definitely worth it, not only for temperatures, but also just for the performance. Now, this is the SN770. This is the SSD that I chose. It's a two terabyte 2280 M.2. It's a gen four drive. It does have a maximum speed of 5150 megabytes a second. This isn't like the most insane SSD. It's definitely not the most insane SSD that this PC could handle. But truthfully, when it comes to storage, and like I said, with this computer, I'm only really gonna be playing games and it doesn't make like that much of a difference. But this is something that I could easily upgrade later on down the line if I feel like I need to, which is something that I'm happy about. And they're just good to have. So even if I did upgrade and I didn't wanna use this in the computer alongside the new one, I could just throw this into another machine. So here's the final cost of the build. It ended up being 1384.17 after taxes, which was 115.82 under budget. So we did a good job. Honestly, the entire build went super smoothly until the graphics card came. Firstly, it was being held by ransom from Canada Post. That's a whole other story. Secondly, when I got it in and actually tried to install it, I noticed a huge issue right off the bat. But let's unbox this thing first because there is a lot to unpack literally inside this box. To celebrate the launch of the Vanguard series, we're thrilled to introduce a limited edition blind box Lucky figure, Lucky Around the World series. We invite players to join in on the fun and collect them all. I almost, I don't even know if I wanna open this. I feel so bad. Oh, I feel like I'm like ruining the value of this thing. I'm sorry, MSI. Come on, that is so cool. <laughs> that is so cool. It's a little lucky dragon in a boba. And then this is the conversion if you wanted to do the uh, 12 volt to, I guess, 12 to 24 pin if you wanted to. I'm gonna just use the 12 pin. I do have an MSI uh, power supply, so the connector should have no issues there. And this is a GPU riser if I need it. Uh, not a riser, a little uh, bracket, seg bracket. Is this gonna fit? Holy man. Okay, MSI, <laughs> this is crazy. Holy, this is huge. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm looking at this GPU and I'm a little scared because this thing is huge and the case that I got isn't too, too big. I guess uh, we just, we have to <laughs> pray and figure it out. This thing is massive. Okay. I mean, rightfully so. This is a triple fan flow through design. It has a massive heat sink, which is great for thermals. And its build quality is genuinely just insane with its aluminum top plate. This is the new generation of NVIDIA GPUs. So this 5070 Ti has a lot going for it in terms of its specs. It's got 16 gigs of GDDR7 video memory, a 28 gigabit per second memory clock, a 256 bit bus, PCI Express 5.0 support, and it has 8,960 
60 CUs. There's three DisplayPort 2.1B outputs, an HDMI 2.1B, and it can support up to an 8K display. The thing that makes this graphics card special though is its raw power. It's close to an RTX 4080, which is the GPU that I was using in the PC that I sold a few months back, but there's also a bunch of new special AI features like DLSS 4.0 that Nvidia has included on this generation, which yes, does mean fake frames. It's not something that you have to use, but I will dive into that in just a little bit. But aside from all of that and the issues that I actually had with this build, like it's insanely long post time making me think that it was broken. This is really the moment of truth. Please give me a display out. Please give me a display out. Oh my God, these Ryzen chip. Wait, waiting a little longer. Oh my God, are you gonna, are you gonna boot? How long does Ryzen take to post? Oh my God. Especially after what we did to this thing, I'm kind of worried now. Okay, um, lights are on, but no one's home. I'm a little confused because everything is on. Everything seems to be working. Um, I'm just not having a post. So should I just restart it? Let's try. Oh, shit. I actually don't know what the problem was. It was booting. Like it showed up the VGA postcode and then it showed up the boot postcode. And then when I unplugged it and plugged it back in, the VGA postcode went away and it was just boot. And then the boot was green. But um, all I did was I turned it on and I spammed delete even though I wasn't seeing an image. And then I got into BIOS. That was weird. I've never seen that before. Like I've never seen no image, but allow me to get into BIOS. So I'm not entirely sure what that was about, but it works. So I'm gonna go through the setup and do that. Me ramming a screwdriver into the motherboard because I wanted to unlatch the GPU because I had to reseat it. Oh God, well, that should be fine. And the fact that I had to disassemble this entire thing once again off camera to make sure that I got the cables out from underneath so that it wasn't interfering with the fans. Yeah, it, it was a lot. So that's it. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a very, very tight fit, but hey, I think it's fit. So that's all that really matters. Yeah, that really could not have been any tighter. I don't think that that would have physically been possible at all. But I'm surprised that I got the intake and the three fans in with the power supply and the massive GPU in there. Oh my God. All in all, I think that this thing actually turned out really good. Usually when I play games, I'm at home on an ultra wide OLED. It's just a 1440p display. Now, when it comes to how this thing actually performs, I decided to run all of the benchmarks in 4K so you could see what the card is actually capable of. That being said, let's not pretend like the Ryzen 5 9600X is a 4K CPU. So there is some bottleneck on the CPU side of things, but I have a 4K monitor here, so I figured why not? For Assassin's Creed Shadows, everything was maxed out native and it ran at about 30 FPS average, which I mean is playable, but not an experience that I would necessarily enjoy, though it seemed pretty stable and it looked insanely good. Now I ran this game on balanced DLSS, still 4K with everything maxed out, but with frame generation enabled. Now this game doesn't support DLSS 4, so the improvements weren't insane, but I saw an average of nearly 90 FPS, which felt really smooth. And on a 4K display, I could hardly tell this apart with DLSS on or off. And for PUBG, I was kind of surprised because this game is quite optimized. Let's just be realistic here. But I was getting around 120 FPS in 4K on max settings. Now this is very playable, but for a shooter, I do like to have more out of it in terms of its frame rate. And for the sake of this benchmark, since we're doing it at 4K and PUBG doesn't support DLSS, I went ahead and dropped it down to the medium preset for its graphics settings. This gave me a massive bump to 180 FPS and it was very smooth. It was kind of shocking to play a game like this, which can be quite annoying on some hardware at 4K. And it was actually saturating my display's 165 Hertz refresh rate. So I was really happy with it. Counter-Strike 2 was similar. At 4K max settings, I saw around a 150 FPS average. Now I don't have specific numbers since CS doesn't work with MSI Afterburner, but it did feel really good and it looked insane. I've never seen this game look this crisp since I usually play it in four by three stretch to try to get close to a thousand frames per second. When I dropped it down to medium, I saw anywhere between two to 300 FPS in 4K. And honestly, I still wouldn't play a competitive shooter like this game in 4K, but if I was going to, I easily could do it with this computer. So 
That is awesome. I tried Frag Punk out. It's a new shooter I've been playing. And by the way, ignore how bad I'm actually playing in these games. I'm set up at the studio and I don't have all the peripherals that I use and whatnot, so just don't judge. But 83 FPS average in 4K on max settings is pretty good. If this was a story-driven game, I'd absolutely play it like this since it looked so nice, but I decided to drop it down to a mix of medium and low settings, and I got an average of around 200 FPS in 4K. Now, if I was to play this game, this is how I do it at 4K. Since everything is super sharp, the quality of the game and the settings don't make much of a difference. Black Ops 6 though, I was having a bunch of issues with it since this game is pretty dependent on your internet connection and latency. And down here in the studio, I'm on Wi-Fi. It's not great, but 82 FPS average, max settings, 4K. Again, if I was playing the campaign of this game, I absolutely would do this because of how gorgeous this game looks maxed out, but I turned on DLSS with frame gen in the balanced mode, and it brought it up to about 140 FPS average, still in max settings. DLSS is not something that I would have really considered for shooters, but honestly, I didn't feel a difference in latency, and for COD, this was a really enjoyable experience, so I was just quite surprised. Fortnite, now this is a weird one. The game defaulted to DirectX 11, which means you lose Nanite and all of those fancy features. When I restarted the game into DirectX 12 and set everything to max in 4K, I only got 50 frames per second. Now, I wouldn't play like this, but I honestly didn't know that Fortnite could look this good, so I was just blown away. The lighting looked insane, the textures were more detailed than I'd ever seen them, and I was just impressed. I turned on DLSS and I put it into performance mode and I saw a huge jump closer to 90 frames per second. This is for sure playable, but I'd drop some settings if I were to run it in 4K for sure. One game that really caught me off guard though was Hogwarts Legacy. At native settings maxed out, I was at around 50 frames per second average. This is with ray tracing. It looked really good and for a story game, I honestly wouldn't mind capping this at 30, but I found out that Hogwarts Legacy actually supports DLSS 4.0 and ray reconstruction. Now, this is the whole value add of these new GPUs like this MS. Vanguard Launch Edition 5070 Ti. Because when I turned this on, I saw a huge increase to 160 frames per second. Now, there's literally no difference in this input latency. I couldn't tell them apart visually, and I was just really impressed to see what these DLSS features were like for myself in person. I did see them at CES when Nvidia announced the GPUs, and I got to take a closer look at them in person, and I was telling everyone, like, you just need to try it. It's one of those things that yeah, despite the fact that I didn't build this PC for 4K gaming, I really think DLSS could bring me to that. I just hope more titles that I actually play jump on this bandwagon soon and start to support it because it makes a really big difference. Now, I've been using this computer for a couple months now and I've been really impressed with it. The thermals that I've seen on the 5070 Ti are honestly just fantastic. I rarely ever see it go above 65 degrees Celsius when actually playing games or having it under load, which is surprising considering the case that I decided to jam this thing into. And I think going with the 360 millimeter AIO was a smart choice considering the case is pretty restricted because it allows for a lot of cooling overhead. And I also never hear those fans spinning, which is something that is really good. Like I said, I do play on a 1440p display most of the time. So I get a lot more performance out of this PC than what you'd actually seen in the benchmarks. But that being said, like I mentioned, it is nice that there at least is the capabilities to play in 4K if I wanted to. Not every title that I play is as demanding as the ones that I've shown. And DLSS 4 is going to make a really big improvement in a lot of titles in the future, so I am stoked about it. It's just nice having a smaller and quieter PC that like kind of just sits in the corner of my desk that I don't have to think that much about and can play literally anything that I want to. So I just want to say thank you so much to MSI for actually setting over that Vanguard launch edition GPU because that 5070 Ti that lives in that PC, I have zero complaints about and it is more than enough for what I need. Also, thank you for watching this video. If you didn't make it to the end, a like and a sub is always appreciated and consider dropping an alligator emoji in the comments down below because it lets me know who the real ones are and if you've actually stuck through. And anyways, until then, I'll see you all in the next one. Peace out.